balance, an important aspect for all in life. It certainly can be difficult to achieve in this fast paced world, but it is so important. Next, we move to facet number two. We return to Mark, who is with Chris Conley, as they discuss the topic of family. You know, family is one of those buzzwords that can encapsulate many things and encapsulate many different things to people. And we're here talking about family as one of the eight facets of life with Chris Conley, our continuing series about achieving a balanced life. And earlier, Chris, we talked about personal development, and that mm -hmm. bleeds right into family because in order to have a better family, I think we all need to be better people, and family is one of the keystones to achieving a better, uh, achieving a balanced life. Right. I, it's the, one of the areas, probably the top two, that people would say is the most important in their life. Let's uh, first off talk about how maybe society paints a, a picture that is constantly changing when it comes to family, but mm -hmm. perhaps isn't giving us the right message when it comes to family. Right. I think one of the things that, that I read years ago that um, brought this to my attention was that society tells us that half of all marriages fail. And the truth is about 75 to 80 percent of first marriages are successful. But what skews the numbers is the data looks at there were 1,200 marriages, there were 1,200 divorce filings, there were 2,000, 2,000. And that's so skewed because second marriages fail at about a 70 percent rate, third marriages at about a 50, and fourth marriages and on about a 30. So it seems that once people decide to end their marriage, it's much easier to end the second, third, fourth. So if we're just looking at the total numbers, it skews the data. So I think as we tell young people that it's a 50-50 proposition, it's easy to say, well, it hasn't worked out for half the population, let's just throw in the towel, and that's not the truth. It's almost setting people up to fail if they're going into a marriage thinking, well, statistics tell me right. this is gonna fail anyways. Exactly. And as we, we try and find the love languages, ex explain that to me. Yeah, uh, gone along the lines of personal development, this was a book that was recommended to me probably by five different people over the course of two or three years. And the title didn't entice me to read it. But after enough people had recommended it, um, I actually went to the library and, and got it on audio. And I listened it to and from on my work commute, and it, it made all the sense in the world to me. Gary Chapman is the author, and he asked the question, is your love tank full? And he identified there's five primary love languages that we have and they are words of affirmation, uh, acts of service, quality time, gifts, and physical touch. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that if your spouse, the way I say I love you to my spouse is through words of affirmation, I could be doing the dishes, I could be giving her hugs and everything else, but if I'm not giving her words of encouragement, it's not saying I love you. And so it's important that we understand what is it that says I love you to each other. And if you go to the website, the five lovelanguages.com, there's a free test anyone can take. And it's about a series of 20 or 30 questions and it'll, it'll spit out a printout of what is your primary secondary love language. And I think that kind of circles back to one of the things we talked about earlier with personal development is if we can see what the, the five love languages are and recognize maybe what we're deficient in, then we can build on that and be, have a, a better relationship with our family members by understanding maybe how they need to hear those love languages from us. Exactly. And like I say, it's different for everyone. And, and he goes on to say it's rare that a spouse would have the same love language. Typically, uh, one might be quality time and one might be gifts or something like that. And gifts isn't have to be expensive, diamonds and whatnot. You know, sometimes it's just the fact I was thinking of you and I bought you this. Speaking of gifts, uh, we've all been there where we've given a child a gift and we pay, perhaps put a lot of thought and effort into that gift and the child doesn't necessarily care about the gift, cares about the effort, maybe cares about the, the wrapping paper, the box the right. gift came in. Children kind of see gifts differently than adults do. They do, but he talks in his book also that uh, the children also have that primary love language. And he, I remember a talk he gave where he gave an example of uh, when he came home from work, his two-year-old would grab hold of him and oh, he didn't want to let go. Well, his primary love language was physical touch. So in order to say I love you to that small child, it was a series of hugs, taking walks, holding hands, things along that line. His four-year-old daughter, would grab his hand and want to take, her to take him to his room to show her what she'd done all day. So her love, primary love language was quality time. And he further made, made the comment that uh, if your child has a primary love language of gifts, that you could be walking on your lunch hour 
and uh, see a, a, a shiny stone that sparkled in the sunlight and take that home and give it to a five-year-old. And if their primary love language is gifts, chances are that five-year-old will still have that rock when he's 25 years old. And I think the other thing to keep in mind with, with children particularly is the gift isn't necessarily as important as spending the time with the child. Exactly. Yep. And what other tips do you have as we look to achieve balanced life through family? I think it's important that we just make memories, you know, with our children because, um, like you said, the boxes seem, as a young age, seem to, to be more appropriate than what the gift was. And we all know that, we talk about it, but we continue to shower them with more gifts. We want the, it seems like we want them to have things that we didn't enjoy growing up. But um, I can recall with my own children, we took a lot of nature walks, and we still talk about those things today in their, in their 30s. So uh, it's not at all about the cost that you spend. 